Hello, everyone, and thank you for participating in the very first ASEO Biologics Kangaroo Roundtable discussion. Our esteemed panel is made up of four physicians. Joining us tonight, we have Dr. Sunil Kapoor from Brigham and Women's Hospital and instructor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Simon Okawule from Jackson Madison General Hospital in Jackson, Tennessee. Dr. John Catanzaro from the University of Florida Health, Jacksonville and Dr. Benjamin D'Souza from Penn Presbyterian Medical Center, Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. During this event, each panelist will introduce a case study of theirs in which the kangaroo envelope was used to promote health of the cardiac device pocket long-term. Um, after each presentation, we will pause for a brief discussion of the case and relevant question and answer. And with that, I will hand it over to our first panelist, Dr. Kapoor. So the case that I wanted to present to kind of stimulate some discussion is a case that I think is just interesting with regards to uh, cardiac device reaction, kind of an educational and unusual finding, but also something that I think is a, a helpful application of the kangaroo pouch and something that we thought was a good use of it in this specific case. So just to describe the case on the next slide, the case is of a 77-year-old gentleman uh, with the initials DN. He has senile cardiac amyloidosis, some valvular heart disease, sinus node dysfunction, PAF is kind of common with the amyloid patients, as well as some heart block. And so underwent a dual chamber pacemaker in the left pectoral area in 2014 by one of my colleagues. The device, the details are listed here. So then he presented in April of 2018 with knee pain and in the ER was incidentally found by the ER physicians to have two weeks of left chest erythema, which he felt fine with and didn't have any symptoms from. So I was actually, I met him at this time when we were called because there was concern for a pocket infection and a need for a full system extraction. But when we went to see him, as you can see on the picture on the right-hand side, the picture was a little different than what we would expect for a classic pocket infection. He hadn't been instrumented in years. It looked pretty benign. He was otherwise well. And on discussion, he has very much has had this erythema that's been coming and going for years since the implant. Every few weeks it comes and then it goes away. And he's been largely unbothered by it. So we were a little skeptical of a diagnosis of a pocket infection. You know, the, we, we looked at the erythema and like I mentioned, it was asymptomatic and he had no other kind of systemic symptoms of infection. It had been recurrent, as I mentioned, the most recent episode being two months ago when his other workup seemed very, very benign and not consistent with a pocket infection. So we called dermatology to see if they had any insight. And what they felt was that this was most contiguous consistent with a diagnosis known as reticular telangiectagic erythema, which is a really benign, safe, containous condition, which manifests as both localized area of blanchial erythema and telangiectasias. And this is actually a relatively uncommon but reported finding in the literature associated with pacemakers and defibrillators in the chest, cav chest wall. This term has been described as telangiectagic pacemaker erythema and a somewhat kind of a rosacea-like manifestation and honestly requires no treatment and kind of comes and goes. We spent a lot of time trying to understand what the mechanism of this might be and in a literature review I think it's fair to say that there's no clear answer but most people believe it's related to some abnormal microvasculature, something wrong in and around the foreign body as the way it's healed into the patient's subcutaneous tissue. So about a year later, we sent him home and he was doing well. About a year later, he unfortunately developed a malignancy, lost a lot of weight, and became bacteremic from a peripheral IV used for his chemotherapy while he was immunosuppressed. He had an infected foot ulcer that was also noted around the time, which was actually the nidus of his malignancy. 
he had a bone osteosarcoma, I believe. Because he had staph bacteremia, we actually extracted the device at that time, and I'll note the pocket looked fine, looked normal. And after an appropriate time, we placed, we decided to place a new dual chamber pacemaker on the contralateral side, on the right chest, and used a kangaroo pouch at that time. Now, the reason we used a kangaroo pouch and we thought it might be helpful in this case was a kind of a couple of reasons. One was, like I mentioned, the patient had become had malignancy infection and become quite cachectic in the interval, even thinner than the picture on the right shows. And so we were worried about the risk of an erosion. We just thought about whether we should just put a submuscular device, but given he was on anticoagulation, thin, otherwise unwell, we thought just doing a standard position, prepectoral position of the device with the kangaroo pouch as a, another layer to protect from erosion might be a helpful thing. And that's what we ultimately decided to do. We also were curious if this pacemaker erythema was related to abnormal microvasculature around the device, whether well, something that could theoretically improve the healing, a more natural healing of the pocket around the device would reduce the risk of having this on the contralateral side. We put the device in and over the following 18 months, he's been well without recurrence of that erythema. He's had, even though he's continued to lose weight, has not had any issues with erosion, and he hasn't had any other issues with infection. I will say that we utilize the kangaroo pouch by soaking it in a solution containing vancomycin, which potentially we feel might be helpful for the reducing of localized infection as well. So I think for those three reasons, we thought that the pouch would be helpful, and obviously, a little bit of an interesting application with regards to reducing microvasculature poor healing, but something that at least in one patient had seems to be a different physiology in how his device has healed. I'll stop there and I would love to hear if other people have thoughts about the utilization of the pouch here or other aspects of the case. Thank you. Tony, I had a question. Did you probably never did it because you didn't reaccess that side for a device, but was he occluded on that side? Because it looked like he was occluded. I mean, if you looked at some of those pictures, those spiders and areas, I would think looks like a chronic, you know, subclavian occlusion or axillary occlusion. Yeah, I think you're right that I think he was occluded. We did put a temporary pacemaker through that area, but I think that was through the extraction sheath, if I remember correctly. So, yeah. You know, whether or not that global kind of macrovasculature which affects the microvasculature and whatnot, I think is a very interesting point. But uh, yeah, I think I think that's right. You know, I'm glad you presented this case because I actually had a lady who was referred to me a month ago, almost the exact same thing. And it was a two year period of time. She had had that exact same waxing and waning discoloration at the sides. And she had seen me previously for consideration of extraction. I went through the entire workup and lo and behold, when I saw her in clinic, there was nothing wrong with the site. And she came in again a month ago, pretty much the exact same picture. And I had actually referred her to a dermatologist because I did not see anything wrong with the site. She does have uh, a history of the device has been in there for about a six and a half year period of time. She had a knee replacement about a year and a half ago. And she had a author, author she had uh, another procedure done on the opposite knee two years ago. And when she started developing issues with the site, they initially thought that it was an infected pocket. But not, nothing that I did in terms of a workup would indicate that. So from the first um, office visit and also this one, I, I declined anything other than an evaluation by dermatology, but I'm glad you presented this. I think that was a very interesting case. Um, you know, in, in my mind, of course, hindsight is twenty twenty. but regarding the, um, the dermatologic manifestation, I'd be curious to see what her immune response was um, if you were to take a histologic sample of one side versus the other, uh, I've seen maybe one or two cases of nickel allergy or allergy to the device, to the generator itself. And, um, I think the, the baseline immune system of the patient, um, whether or not those circulating immunoglobulins or, um, 
if it's a mast cell reaction or, or of some sort, can just be some sublevel that's that ultimately gets activated when the immune system becomes susceptible, uh, which then waxes and wanes as our immune mm -hmm. system usually does from time to time. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there, you know, it may be a combination of the the, the dermatologic response, the immune system of the patient, and then the reaction of the local cells in and around the capsule area. But what's, uh, in my mind, what's also interesting is the reticular pattern and the diffuse pattern, because it wasn't just in the area of yeah. the um, of the generator, yeah. like Ken mentioned. It's the, yeah, it's the entire chest, and that's the exact same manifestation of the patient that I saw. And um, that's also another thing that kind of clued me in and said, I, I did not think it was just the pocket. It couldn't be. And the device had been in there for many, many years, but, but you're right. You're right. Wow. All right, Simon Okiwale, um, cardiac electrophysiology. I have a private group in Jackson, Tennessee, which is in the south, um, southeastern part of the, of the state, smack dab in between Nashville and Memphis. 74-year-old um, female with a BMI of 16.5, so, so underweight. Um, and just to kind of refresh everyone's memory, um, you know, a BMI of 18.5 to 24.9 is considered normal and anything greater than or equal to 30 is considered obese. And she was a lady that had um, a past medical history of six cents in tachybrady, as well as paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, coronary artery disease, thyroid disease, as well as chronic pancreatitis. Um, she presented with me um, to me with um, symptoms such as worsening, uh, fatigue, malaise, and evidence of the tachybrady on a, a monitor that was done. And at that point in time, we decided to go ahead implant a dual chamber um, Boston Scientific Accolade MRI device. And the information um, about the device uh, is there. I typically do a cut down approach using the cephalic vein um, as my access point. And um, relevant medication, she's on Eliquis, she's on Tocolol, Plavix, Aspirin, Prednisone, um, and the prednisone was being used to actually stimulate her appetite because of the issues with the chronic pancreatitis. She's on the weight and had had reduced PO intake for almost a year's period of time. And also she was on supplements for chronic pancreatitis. And this is just a diagram of just my, you know, just general anatomy. We're very much familiar with that, that image that I've shown. All right, so this is obviously not the lady that I'm referring to, but this is pretty much the picture of, of, of my patient. And uh, my incision um, is typically about one or two centimeters just below the clavicle. And the first thing that I was presented with was a lady that was fairly frail, underweight. And the area in which I would make the incision as well as insert my leads has a little bit of a divot, which is where the arrow is. And in addition to the um, chronic steroid use, the area is thinned out. And uh, my biggest concern with her was um, risk of poor wound healing and also just not having enough tissue to work with to allow for that area and that incision to heal well. So I voiced my concerns with her. And I let her know that, you know, she absolutely needed the device. But one of the things that we were going to do was that I was going to um, um, use a, a kangaroo pouch um, to add just an additional extra matrix and also to allow for that area um, to heal a little bit better. For the, um, for the Boston Scientific Accolade devices, they typically recommend a medium-sized um, uh, pouch. Uh, my incision is, like I had mentioned, about one to two inches below the clavicle, but I tend to, um, to kind of put the pocket further down as deep as possible. I, I do not do a superficial pocket. And in this lady, as aesthetics was also something she was concerned about, I wanted the um, pocket to be, and the device to be as flush as possible. And um, the suture sleeves were going to be kind of in the area where that divot was. And also a portion of the leads um, I feared would also be a little bit prominent along that area that has the divot. So rather than use the recommended sized uh, uh, pouch, I upsized to from a medium to a large. So 
after that, I would have another maybe um, one and a half to maybe almost two centimeters to kind of play with. The, um, the size for the medium is about a 6.9 by 6.5 centimeters. The size for the large is about a 6.9 to an 8 centimeter um, diameter. And what I intended to do was to use that extra um, area of pouch and essentially kind of tack it over um, the suture sleeve at that level of the clavicle so as to allow for just an added area and also essentially just a, an extra barrier and allow for appropriate wound healing. My fear um, with, with the suture sleeve and also a portion of the lead was that because the air was thinned out, because the area was also hollowed out and she also has some degree of kyphosis, that it was an increased area of lead as well as um, suture sleep erosion. And using the um, kangaroo pouch by itself would just kind of help um, create just an extra uh, matrix, an extra uh, layer of tissue um, to promote good wound healing. So, you know, um, we all know the importance of the suture sleeves themselves. And um, um, we've all been involved in those cases where you have um, those cachectic, frail patients um, that just as a result of body habitus and also as a result of their anatomy, um, the suture sleeves become extremely prominent and could possibly erode. Because of the fact that for especially in new implants, there's a high chance of, of you know, of poor wound healing and um, post-op, and um, also lead dislodgement if you have uh, a suture sleeve that is actually not anchored appropriately. Um, I felt that this would be the best way for us to allow that area to heal appropriately. Um, you know, I, I like everyone else, did anchor um, with um, silk um, and down to the tissue in terms of the suture sleeve. And what I, in, what I did with the pouch was that once I kind of got it over the suture sleeves themselves, I tacked it down to the tissue and over the, the um, portions of the lead that was just underneath my incision. And I sutured down to the tissue underneath using um, uh, O-Vicol. I chose to use O-Vicol as opposed to um, silk to anchor the uh, to anchor the path was my fear was that if I used a non-absorbable um, um, silk that that area which was already thinned out I didn't want a situation whereby the suture by itself which was non-absorbable could also possibly erode through that site. All right, um, I've used this for a number of patients who are underweight, but I've also applied this um, to patients who have had um, you know the chronic um, steroid use skin, paper thin, older, frail patients. And um, this can obviously be applied not just to pacemakers themselves, but I've also applied the same approach to ICDs as well as CRT devices. And um, in the case of, I use probably about 95% of my devices in terms of implants of Boston. And so if I have an ICD, I'm looking at, as opposed to using a large pouch, upsizing into an extra large and essentially applying the exact same principle. Um, so that I applied in terms of the pacemaker to that. Um, our lady had a follow-up at three as well as seven week post-op and the incision healed well, the area healed well, and that divot kind of filled in. And so she did well. Thank you, Dr. Okulay. That was great. Um, I just have a quick question. Uh, yeah. I'll start it off. But, you know, do you think, uh, you know, you've been using this technique for a while now. Uh, have you noticed that patients you know, don't complain of, of pocket pain potentially as much, or has there been any sort of correlation in your opinion? No, I mean, for, for, for the most part, the patients don't have any issues with, with the, the sites healing. You know, for the, for the individuals that have the thinned out skin and have lost muscle mass, and so everything kind of sinks in, one of the big things they will complain about um, prior to me adopting this technique was the seat belt rubbing up against the incision and also the seat belt rubbing up against the suture sleeve or a portion of the lead. And for some individuals, you really don't have a lot of muscle or tissue to work with. So this approach, you know, that, that I adopted, it's worked out really well and there have been no issues or any complaints to kind of speak of. You bring up an, an interesting concept, which I, I hadn't really thought of before in terms of doing this in general. Obviously, when we use pouches, whether they be the antibiotic, you know, synthetic Tyrex pouch or whether it be kangaroo, I typically don't put the lead into the pouch itself when they're redundant. 
I'll usually just put, put the can in and then, you know, tie it down or not tie it down. But, you know, similar to the case we had shown before, I'm sure we'll talk about more and I have some pictures later to show. I'm interested to actually hear what you guys think of that, whether that actual, that inflammatory reaction, you know, that stuff that forms around the leads when we have to dissect them when we do generator changes, yeah. whether that would not form if we also used a bigger version of a pouch for each case and put the leads in there as well. Same concept as what we're using for the generator. I just don't, I've never done that before, but maybe I should. So, so I, I will wrap, so I will place the, um, the pulse generator within the pouch and I will wrap the leads and put it in the pouch also because I, I extract devices. And the worst thing to deal with is just the adhesions, the scarring, and also the just, I, I want that pocket and I want the leads as possible to be as pristine if God forbid we have to do an extraction. And so that's why I started doing it. And I started doing it after I did an extraction on a patient who had an existing, I believe it was a Tyrex, and it was horrible. And because, I mean, if you guys do the extractions also, you know that if you start out with a lead that is badly compromised, that's essentially falling apart before you do anything with stylets, before you do anything with the sheath, that is a recipe for a very, very long and difficult case. And that's yeah, why I, I, I completely agree. I. I routinely um, adopt that adopted that um, that practice of, of enveloping. I mean, you essentially want to preserve the the micro environment that you're going to potentially go back in. So the way you leave it is, it, yeah. you at least want it to be better than when you left it uh, when you close the pocket. And and I've seen physical um, at least leads have no yeah. fibrosis. Uh, you can see what you're doing when you're dissecting the leads. Um, they're not adhered to one another, and you don't have to bobby them apart or, or use blunt dissection. And like Dr. Okawali said, um, you know, you're essentially only left with what's there to remove your system. So the better situation you are when you start, the more, ch the higher the chance of success um, when you do go to um, look for the inner conductor and put a stylet down to engage uh, traction on the um, on the lead. Yeah. One question I had, and I was curious what everyone's thoughts were, is for thin patients, when we're worried about healing acutely, you know, tension on the incision itself is something we're trying to avoid. So putting the device, the leads away from the incision, uh, trying to relieve that tension is one issue. And so if you use a pouch, then you put the can, you push that down away from the incision. That's one role. But we're worried about it at the incision. And so the idea of like oversizing, so you cover both the incision and the uh, can, the leads itself, makes a lot of sense, like you're describing. Yeah. But I mean, has anyone ever tried, you know, not using a pouch as a pouch, but kind of more of an arts and crafts project, trying cutting pieces, using extra pieces, doubling yeah. up on one side? Um, you know, like you mentioned for the Tyrex, I've yeah. almost never use the Tyrex as a pouch. I use it as a, you know, we cut it and you know, make whatever shape sizes we want. Um, what are your guys' experience with doing that with the kangaroo? I've done it once. I, I, I did it once. I had, um, we had, um, we did not have the traditional large and extra large. Not We did not have the medium of the large. We had an extra large and I had an excess amount of pouch. And honestly and truly, I just cut off that excess and I put the device as, as I would normally plant it, just um, left peg side. And with the extra area of the extra pouch, I literally just took it and I just um, sewed it right over the, um, the suture sleeve. And I sewed it right over the portion just before um, the lead kind of um, um, went um, underneath the fabrical. And it essentially just was just kind of just a little covering over it. I did that and worked out okay. John Catanzaro, I am 
at the University of Florida in Jacksonville. Um, our population is a little bit different um, than Dr. Okawali's. Uh, I'd say most of our patients' BMI is on average around 30. Roundtable discussions like this are great because you sort of get tunnel vision when you're you know, seen with uh, the same thing over and over again, and, and you really don't learn unless you really watch um, someone else's experiences. So with that, you know, I really appreciate everybody today that, that's on here because every uh, case is a learning experience. But um, my kind of passion evolved to sort of uh, using the um, extracellular matrix for the, um, for the subcutaneous ICD, sort of uh, an out of the box um, use. And I think part of that um, has to do with defibrillation itself and how vital defibrillation is. Implant is everything, and I think everybody's made that clear so far because what you implant is where you're going to go eventually when you do a generator change or if you, when you have to upsize uh, or upgrade anything. And I think when it comes to the subcutaneous ICD, there's a lot of barriers of defibrillation that we don't necessarily see, um, meaning if we did an MRI or a CT scan of patients, um, whether it's uh, sternal adipose tissue here seen um, in the red uh, arrow area, um, or you can have um, visceral adipose tissue as well, as well as subcutaneous fat, pericardiac fat, and epicardial fat. Um, all the adipose tissue, especially visceral when compared to um, epicardial fat, the metabolism is different, but it, they all serve as barriers of defibrillation. And essentially, the goal is to maintain your vector and to essentially deliver energy uh, in a vector uh, toward the center of left ventricular mass to successfully defibrillate the patient. And if your implant um, fails to eliminate as much of these barriers of defibrillation as possible, then you run the risk of um, optimal, def optimal or the lowest defibrillation threshold that you can get on the day of implant. Now, what happens on the day of implant is certainly different from what happens after the implant, and this is dynamic. And I think for that reason, not only optimizing your procedural technique, but kind of thinking ahead and knowing that if I'm going to get a capsule that's going to be avascular, non-conductive, and be an additional barrier of defibrillation, why wouldn't I set myself up for um, the most amount of success or the lowest DFT as possible when I go in in the future? So even if we look at um, sternal adipose tissue, studies have shown that two to three millimeters, if you're not really scraping that bone, that sternum as you go in, if you uh, miss it by two to three millimeters, uh, there's an exponential increase in your DFT, which is pretty scary. Um, the HRS still recommends um, for the class uh, by consensus DFT checking in subcutaneous ICDs. And I know it's fallen out, fallen out, of, um, out of vogue by, by our traditional transvenous ICDs, but I think whenever there is a disruptive technology available, there's a lot that's not going to be known. And at the same time, when you're a first mover, you're going to learn that there are going to be faults w within the uh, technology that you're going to, to really learn as you move into the future. So why use the sub-Q size kangaroo for the SICD? So it's all about the DFT, and the DFT, as as everyone uh, knows, is so vitally important because you have to maintain a vector, and you also have to maintain an amount of energy toward that center of LV mass. And all those are influenced by variables that are related to patient anatomy, the plan of your implantation, the orientation of your generator, and the position of the coil. So failure to attain either stabilization of the generator to the chest wall can result in an elevated shock impedance. Now, we all use shock impedance these days as a surrogate for a DFT. And in my mind, it would be great if we had data to show that, yes, if my shock impedance is less than 100, as um, you know, as Boston says, 90% of the time, I'll have 90% success in my DFT. So um, you know, I, th I think that um, you knowing in your mind that these barriers of defibrillation exist, and if you can avoid them and minimize your defibrillation to get your low, lowest DFT, you'll be starting out at the head of the race with, with the fastest speed. Um, using this novel biodegradable biologic envelope, and specifically a suture orientation, can be used to effectively stabilize the SICD to the, the, um, the chest wall or the, or the rib cage, and also promote tissue regeneration. So 
um, you're essentially doing two things. One, you're promoting natural vascularity within the tissue. Um, the capsule around the SICD is going to be conductive, and because the vector, uh, either primary or secondary, has to go to the can, you essentially want to retain that electroconductivity around the can, because as I mentioned before, anything else is going to turn into a fossil, and it's going to act as an additional barrier of defibrillation. So just briefly, um, I'll show a quick case. Um, my fellow and I and, and uh, colleagues here, we had a case of a 24-year-old with a secondary prevention SICD uh, put in at an outside hospital, and she came in. Her BMI was around 35 to 37. Uh, she came in, and we had a, um, a fluoroscopy image. And the fluoroscopy image essentially showed that the defibrillator, the SICD, was essentially moved from a posterior position where it should be to an anterior position and flapped out. So what we were able to do, knowing that we can use the ECM envelope and the kangaroo sub-Q envelope, is take advantage of two things. One, take advantage of the natural physiology of the change in um, and inf moving from an inflammatory to a non-inflammatory uh, macrophage state, but also you're able to anchor superiorly and inferiorly using the material itself. Um, and you know, if we, a lot of the Europeans uh, started out with intramuscular uh, placement, and I think that's been adopted in the United States. But as I say, with um, with Boston, you know, because you're a first mover and and your technology is first out there, there's going to be more things we're going to learn. That's why we don't call it the IMICD; it's the SICD. So you can see we're changing the name already because we're learning newer techniques to move the device closer to the heart by putting it in between the serratus anterior and the, and the latissimus dorsi. But there is a good population for subcutaneous implantation. And by using the suture technique, what you're actually doing is you're preserving your vector. So you're preserving your vector, yet at the same time preserving that electroconductive environment around the SICD that guess what? You're going to have to go in now, seven, eight years later, we're seeing new generator changes. And I think the same thing is going to happen as we move into the IM. So when you do have to get a generator change and you look between the two muscles, there's going to be a big fossilized avascularized capsule that mm -hmm. people may have to debride and probably may not want to debride because it's going to be a lot of bleeding around the area because of the muscle. The muscle. So if we can start out by putting one of these in everyone, whether it's sub-Q, or I am, you can, you can um, optimize yourself from the get-go to, to promote that, um, that microenvironment around the, the generator, which is so important to stabilize the vector and also to stabilize and maximize the amount of energy, energy that's projected to that vector toward the center of left ventricular mass to successfully defibrillate the patient. This is uh, just a picture. You can see how the device um, actually tilted out laterally and anteriorly. What we were able to do with this is bring the device flush against the rib cage, stabilize that vector with the um, sub-Q uh, exercise matrix, and in addition, perform DFTs and ensure the patient had successful DFTs at 65 joules with an appropriate shock impedance less than 100 ohms, and the patient has done well since. So this just brings out a recent study about generator changes. Um, this is from 2019, not too far away, but. If we look at March 2020 in heart rhythm, they looked at DFT testing in patients who were undergoing SICD gen changes. And um, out of uh, five of 25 patients actually failed DFTs. So right. things change. Patients get amiodarone, uh, whether it's by medication, DFTs can increase. If they increase the amount of epicardial, pericardial fat, increase their sternal fat, or even increase their visceral fat, those are all additional barriers of defibrillation, which may change and um, alter the DFT. So this is a real issue. And I think it's, um, I mean, it may be a small number. And I know the, the authors use the term uh, in the conclusion, DFT testing is mandatory, which is a very strong word. But this just brings up an awareness that's pretty recent that when you go back and to change these generators, you want to make sure the patients leave and are still protected. So I think this is something that more data is required to uh, to actually look at. Um, and I think by looking at the shock impedance as a surrogate, we can learn more about um, preserving those DFTs as patients undergo generator changes and what to do at the time of generator change.
So some take home points. Um, the sub Q ECM provides a natural healthy environment for encapsulation. It undergoes angiogenesis and, and vascularization with oxygen delivery serving an electrically conductive medium for DFTs. Um, it also avoids calcium and fibrosis. So, you know, whether or not it's eggshell calcification that we're all typically uh, aware of, of a dialysis patients where you can actually put your hand in the pocket and almost yeah. get cut from the eggshell calcification. Calcium also serves as a barrier for defibrillation. Um, so in addition to calcium, fibrosis, and fat, uh, this, is, can, this can all be avoided by using the ECM. And finally, given the dynamic BMI changes in patients, um, you know, this really provides a medium most conductive to maintain as close as you're going to be to your baseline DFTs at implantation. Thank you, Dr. Kinsaro. Um, I had a quick question. So I think you alluded to this, but you know whether or not you implant um, intermuscular um, or subcutaneous. Do you, you know, have have you seen that one area um, generates more scar tissue, less scar tissue, or is it, you know, too early to tell? Um, that's a great question. I think it's uh, for me, it's a bit early to tell. I think more of the um, more of the extractors will see sub sub pec pockets. Um, I've seen some sub. I used to extract. I stopped, um, but um, some of the sub pectoral pockets, uh, the the capsule is still going to be an inflammatory capsule and and be avascular. It's just going to happen to be next to the muscle. So I think whether or not it's intramuscular or subcutaneous, as long as you're following that inflammatory macrophage response, you're going to get exactly what's delivered in the same area, whether it's intramuscular or subcutaneous. So I think this poses a potential problem as we move forward and as more people see um, the the two different sites, then I'd be interested in seeing pictures and, and also histology from both sites to see if indeed they are identical. Yeah, it's an interesting concept. I, I'm trying to think of how this could be studied meaning having the absence of a capsule in a subcutaneous or intramuscular, you know, SICD, whether it changes the DFTs and or changes the shock impedance, because all the patient, every patient's different. And, you know, at the time when you implant, that's not formed. So you're not going to be able to, you're not going to be able to, you know, put a kangaroo in DFT. I mean, it, you could take it out in DFT, but in the same patient at the same time, but just doing one DFT to the other is not, it's stochastic. So, um, I just don't know how to study it, but it would be an interesting thing to prove in addition to um, obviously the benefits of using for sub cues and, 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 and kangaroo, it's a no brainer. I don't know why anyone would ever do it for every, those incisions are, are much bigger. Yeah. We have the same obesity population in Philadelphia as you guys do in Florida and pretty much everywhere in America. Um, yeah. So these are really miserable to close when everything is adipose or this, or the patient that we showed earlier who was super skinny where there's not a lot of tissue there. Unless you have a patient not too big or not too small, these are kind of a bear to, to close. So mm -hmm. I think just from that standpoint, but the DFT concept is an interesting one, which I don't think has been shown before, at least with using something like this. I just don't know how to study it, but I think it, would be, it would be really interesting uh, to prove. No, I think that that's a great idea. Um, and I think that's one of the goals is to try to look into that. Um, I'd be curious to see from, from the panel, do you, implant subcutaneous or intramuscular or is it um, depending upon I mean if you get a, a very 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 thin patient most people will not want to go subcutaneous um, but then again if you once you make that incision I've seen people make the incision thinking they're going to find the, the fascial plane between the two muscles and then it's not there and then it's like okay now we have to shift to the subcutaneous route so I'd be curious to see what your experiences are whether you start out directly um, subcutaneous, knowing you're going to put it subcutaneous or whether or not you um, you go intramuscular and make sort of a more anterior oblique incision rather than a, a, a one that's parallel to the um, to the rib cage. You know, I mean, my my incision for the sub Q, I mean, because as you pointed out, more so than anything else with the sub Q devices, the pocket is everything. Um, because if you have that incision and if you make the pocket and it's not appropriate in terms of location, you are playing catch up at that point in time. I tend to make a small incision 
just use my fingers to go all the way down till I see the fascia and then from there create a small enough pocket. And for me, it is infinitely easier to have a pocket that I need to extend out than to have a big one or large one to begin with and you are trying to essentially fill in that area. However, the point that you made in terms of the two sutures, that's brilliant because regardless <laughs> of you. where you may, yeah, regardless of where you may fall short in terms of the pocket itself, if you've located the ideal location, you can now implant and tack down and suture down in that side. And you don't have to use the suture hole that you know comes with the, the sub Q. It doesn't matter what the positioning is. Yeah. So, yeah. Nice thing. That's really yeah, great. Thank you. I appreciate that. Great. I, I, I think I saw that before, so I, I've adopted. Mm -hmm. We do 50 50. It's really patient dependent. You know, if they're on any coagulation, they bleed like stink if, you, if you're yeah. cutting so, um, you know, for the bigger patients, I think it is ideal to get it as close to the, you know, the, the, the bone as possible. But we've, we've definitely moved towards a more intramuscular approach at Penn, but um, uh, we haven't had to change those out yet. So, you know, we, we've yeah. only recently started. I haven't, done any, I haven't done any of those yet either. So in, you know, eight to 10 years, we'll have to figure out how bad it's going to be. Yeah. Yeah, we pretty much uniformly will do intramuscular, you know, if, if possible. Like you said, sometimes people's latissimus isn't as big as you would want it to be or easily identifiable. But, you know, I think it's like a really interesting application of the kangaroo for the subcutaneous defibrillator because that study that you showed is like, it's really compelling that, you know, the, the shock impedances went up and they, at least reportedly, and we've had a similar experience, you know, can remedy that by doing a capsulectomy. You know, if you get rid of that one factor, their impedances and their DFTs improved. And it really does point that, you know, getting rid of that capsule or preventing that capsule might be helpful. I think, you know, especially doing it intramuscular, I think we've all had the experience doing a capsulectomy on an intramuscular, a muscular, uh, submuscular pocket is a real, real arduous time spending thing because they bleed like stink and you really really have to be meticulous so anything you can do to avoid a capsulectomy anything you can do to avoid an intramuscular capsulectomy is super huge let alone the fact that you're going to be protecting them from a better dft so i think it's a really interesting application So um, my name is Ben D'Souza. Um, I uh, work at Penn Presbyterian at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, cardiac electrophysiologist there. Um, so I'm going to show two cases. I'll go relatively quickly through both of them. Um, so these were both cases actually fairly recently that I had uh, done. The patients were nice enough to allow me to photograph them during the procedure. Um, and so um, these are cases that uh, I sort of wish that the people who had done their initial implants had used a kangaroo for and didn't and uh, sort of made my life miserable. And so um, the first patient, you know, similar to the first case we looked at, thin skinned um, lady who essentially had had a uh, pacemaker implanted in 2012 came in for routine generator change. Now, a lot of times we will get these referred to us from other uh, smaller practices in Pennsylvania or New Jersey, haven't even met the patient before they come in for the first time when I see them. So I'm not really sure what I'm dealing with until I come in Monday morning. I'm like, okay, let's figure out what we're doing. So, um, And so sort of as expected, um, this lady, uh, and you could see the picture sometimes can't do it justice into sort of how skinny she was, but you could see her leads, you could see her can um, sort of when you sort of get in there and you're like, I'm already concerned that this lady is going to have an issue. Um, but you can see there that that's that sort of capsule formation that we're all sort of grown to see. And so I did um, do a capsulectomy. And so um, while I didn't show all the gory details of it, you know, uh, there was a lot of bleeding. The leads were hard to see. There was not, you know, it's, it's it, you know, doing a lot of this stuff blind, unfortunately, sometimes. And so um, I did end up removing it and placing um, a kangaroo. And um, for this patient, I think most people uh, believe that using a a Tyrex or a you know, synthetic antibiotic pouch for these patients is, yes, you should definitely do it. That's what the New England Journal paper showed in terms of efficacy. I think it's wrong when people apply, for instance, you know, the rapid study or studies that looked at generator changes and compare it to 
kangaroo because the yeah. concept is completely it's different. different. Yeah. They're, they're a different mechanism. And I think that a lot of people misconstrue that when they're deciding what they want to use, you know, to Sonny's point of it's a different patient population, it's a different risk, and there are different approaches that you're supposed to take. Um, so this was a case that um, just recently presented to us at Penn. So this was a 48-year-old, sort of very unfortunate gentleman, um, young guy who had cardiac mm -hmm. sarcoid. He actually came in because he had an acute stroke, um, was not, uh, he actually was lost to follow-up. He was not seen at Penn. He was seen at another institution, which will be unnamed. And um, he uh, essentially, uh, we got called for a device check because they wanted to see if the patient had AFib not for what you guys can see on his x-ray is uh, really unfortunate lead positioning. Um, and so um, this gentleman actually had failed DFTs. He, as you can see, has a dual coil device and had a sub Q array put in for failed DFTs with this lead positioning and then was sent home and was not seen for a, a long period of time. He's in his forties and um, presented to us um, just for, um, again, he didn't even know that anything was wrong with his device. And so um, he uh, essentially came uh, with this looking. Uh, and then so you can already sort of see from the x-ray, but I'll try to portray uh, the pain that I had to go through with this case. But you can sort of see where his generator is compared to where his incision is. So clearly this can fell all the way down centimeters um, and pulled the leads with it um, and pulled them back significantly. And the decision was made not to put a new lead in or extract it was to put it in an array, which I believe obviously was the wrong decision. And so that's me just showing you from where the incision was to where the tip of the can was. So my whole finger is in, and um, I got a pretty long index finger. And so uh, it was, it was it, I essentially, same thing, was blindly dissecting um, this device out to try to get it to a point where I could at least just free up the, the generator. This wasn't even really doing anything. Um, we had discussed with this patient about having the entire system extracted and re-implanted, which is what we recommended, um, but he did not want that, unfortunately. And so we tried and um, he had opted. He was concerned because the leads had been in for some time and it was a dual coil um, lead uh, of, um, you know, SVC tear and, and possible bad outcomes. So his choice, I don't agree with that. And I'm not even an extractionist and didn't agree with that. But the patient um, chose to just have a, a lead revisions, which is what I was doing. Um, so again, it, it's sort of hard to conceptualize, but all of you guys who know who have been in this kind of stuff know what this stuff feels like. Um, and similar eggshell comments that we had earlier with capsules, the entire system was sort of completely fibrosed. Um, and, uh, you know, despite lots of efforts and lots of time um, freeing up all this stuff, uh, it, it took a long time to do all this um, and was able to finally free it up. And so, you know, obviously after I finally, and this was one of those cases where, you know, there's just this much of the atrial lead, because obviously I abandoned the RV lead and put in a new RV lead, um, but had to have, you know, the tech holding with some sort of non, you know, uh, some sort of uh, ability with the pickups to just put the lead in. Like there's so little slack that was left on this after it, w it pulled back and because of all the scar tissue that was there and because of how far down it was um, from where the incision was. It was a very difficult and unfortunate case. And so, um, you know, I obviously put, used a kangaroo and then um, what I might have considered doing is for the abandoned lead stuff, putting something around that as well because there's, you know, a lot of other lead component now sort of sitting there. There's the there's the header part for the sub-Q array, which was sitting there. Um, there's the other dual coil lead, which is there um, to sort of prevent that scar tissue, which I'll, I'll probably do in the future. Um, but this was just sort of one of those, man, I wish they had done the right thing for the patient the first time. Yeah. Um, and that uh, sort of a cautionary tale of what certainly can happen in the, the device world. We can play this while I sort of ask one last set of questions. Do you guys routinely, so obviously that was a device that migrated down do you guys routinely tie down your generators um, for your de novo implants for your pacers and ICDs, uh, regardless of body habitus, or um, or not so much? I always do. I always do. What I do is that, um, just as you're doing in terms of just placement um, of the of the device in the, the pouch, I will take a bite of the pack muscle, make it tie, and then from there take my needle pass it through the pouch, pass it through the eyelet of the um, of the header, and then pass it through the other end of the pouch and tie it down. 
Yeah, so that's interesting whether, you know, I, I, I for a time did not tie my generators down and then had too many sort of cans migrate and patients being unhappy with me and not wanting to go back in there and change their pocket. But I'm interested to know whether you guys think you have to, if you tie down to the pouch itself, whether you even need to go through the header itself or or no. I, so I stopped doing that because it makes it a little bit easier for me to not have to worry about where the header is and not hit the leads yeah. and stuff. I mean, to, to to me, it's not that big of a, an extra. It's not. It's not that it made made you extra step. It's not. And for me, it's just kind of one fell swoop. I, I get everything lined up, and so I just that's just out of habit. Whether or not it makes an overall difference, I'm not entirely sure, but um, it's just something I've gotten into the habit to. But I also tie down my uh, my in terms of generator changes, everything gets gets tied down. Everything, everything, because um, I mean, for me, being an explanter. I want as little chance or little. I, I don't want a scenario where I have to go back in, mm -hmm. and um, and that anything that I can do on the front end to avoid that, I'll do it. And um, and yeah, that's that's. I I didn't used to before until just like you said. You know, you get those cases where you have the can that migrates and dislodges the leads, or the can that migrates and causes issues with the patients, and that's not what you want to deal with. I yeah, agree. I I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Same here. I tie down. I used to only tie down defibrillators, thinking that they were heavier and pacemakers weren't. But you know, no, I've had a lot of pacemakers. No. Even I've seen people that migrate closer to the axilla and you know, exactly. comfortable. Yeah. I just as a kind of a third different uh, approach. When I use the pouch, I put it through the the. I tie down just the pouch and not through the eye of the pacemaker yeah. or defibrillator. And I, the reason I do that is I put, try and put as much of the leads into the pouch as possible as well. And so mm -hmm. I always have this fear that I'm going to try and go and hit the yeah. eye and get one of the leads with the needle. So I, yeah. that's kind of a, I put more leads in there uh, and then try and avoid hitting those leads with the needle by just, just capturing at least one portion of the pouch. 